Hey everybody, it's Dr. Scott here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a clinical psychologist. I create intensive outpatient programs to help people with moderate to severe mood and anxiety disorders. I'm also the author of the book For What Everything Is Burning and the host of this podcast or YouTube channel or whatever format you happen to be listening to it in. I have been asked to give a presentation a few times this year to a few fairly large audiences. And the first one is this week. And uh, I'm going to give it to you all first for a couple reasons. One, because I think that this information will be helpful to a lot of people, and I care about you all. I want you to be able to use it. Um, the other is that I need to practice, <laughs> and I need to see how long this presentation is actually going to take. So this is going to be my practice run here today, which means a couple things. It means, unlike most of my content, this is going to be a single take. There's going to be one very long uh, episode, and there's going to be no cuts, no edits, so I might get lost every now and then or screw some things up. Please bear with me. It's my first time running through it. It's about 5.45 a.m. Uh, I've been awake for less than an hour. I just finished my workout. So yeah, perfect conditions. Time to go. Let's do this. So before I get into the strategies that I'm going to talk about today, I want you to know just a little bit more about who I am and where I come from. I know I just gave you the short version of my professional credentials. I honestly don't think, I'm not going to say they're not important, um, but there's a lot of psychologists out there. Uh, there's a lot of people out there who ha have one reason or another to, you know, like professionally be able to tell you, hey, I, I have some answers for you. I know some things for you. Uh, there's a lot of people who want to sell you some answers out there. And I don't think my professional training really sets me apart from those people. What I want you to know about me and my background is that from ages 13 to 20, I was so depressed that I was basically non-functional. Like, didn't really go to school, didn't have a social life, didn't develop skills, didn't take care of myself. I, I barely did anything. And I actually was able to pull myself out of that with no professional support, no therapy, no medication. I do not recommend that approach. Zero out of five stars, would not do again. But I was able to get myself from there to a place in 2015 where I had my doctorate in psychology. I had a family. I had a, a wife and a kid at that point. I have two kids now. I had a house, I had a car, I had a good job. And, and I didn't ever think I was going to have any of those things. Like I spent a good chunk of adolescence and even early adulthood thinking, those things aren't going to happen for me. That's not going to be my life. That's not my path forward. My original plan in life was to buy like a shack or a cabin in the woods, maybe do like hunting or fishing guiding, and maybe work at like a gas station for supplemental income and try to live off the land as much as possible so that I didn't need very much money because I really did not believe I would ever be able to have like a regular, uh, you know, employment type job with like a boss and, you know, insurance and a 401k and all that stuff. I just didn't see it happening for me. So obviously I was very wrong about that. I placed a lot of artificial limitations on myself that seemed totally valid and totally realistic at the time that ended up not being that. And because of that, there were two surprises. I, I don't know why I'm holding my hand like that. That's not really a two. There were two surprises that, that kind of awaited me in, in adult life. One was that I was able to achieve all those things, which I never in a million years thought would happen. The other, possibly even bigger surprise, is that despite achieving numerous very high goals and dreams that I would have once, would have long considered impossible, I still wasn't very happy. Like it was better, don't get me wrong. 2015 compared to 1999, Pick 2015 every time. But it still wasn't great. My life really didn't feel or function the way I wanted it to. For a very different reason at this point. What I was feeling in 2015 was that I was stretched too thin. I, I, I had gone from having nothing that I cared about to having many things that I cared about. And I had absolutely no idea how to deal with that. And I actually think a lot of people find themselves in that situation because... Once we get to the point where we have a lot of good things in our life, you know, we have, we have families, careers, and homes, and stuff like that, it tends to become a matter of resource management or resource allocation. So you have, you know, every day, you have a finite amount of time, energy, and attention, and you're going to end up using all of them 
whether you're doing it on purpose or not, whether you whether you have a plan or not, they're all going to get used by the end of the day, right? E even if you're not like literally exhausted, there's no rollover. You start a new budget the next day. And what I was feeling in 2015 was I needed to do more of everything. Like I, I, I it wasn't like a matter of work life balance or like, oh, I'm, I'm too much in this part of my life and not enough. It was, there was not enough of anything. I loved my job, but I was pretty new at it. It was still very hard. My job, of course, being a, a psychologist or a therapist, um, it still felt really difficult. And I still didn't feel like I was really getting through to people or helping people the way I knew I could. It felt like there was a big divide between where I was and where I could be or where I should be. But it was a very demanding job. It was a very draining job. And so when I'd come home to my family who you know hadn't seen me all day and, and wanted to spend time with me, I had next to nothing left to give them. I, I didn't have time or energy left over to go to the gym or take care of my home or like take care of myself. I mean, I, I look at pictures of me then and I'm like, I was, it doesn't even look like I was like showering or doing my hair. I mean, it's, it, it looks really bad in retrospect. Um, I had friends, but I didn't really have a lot of time to spend with the friends. So all my relationships felt very superficial. You know, like we, we just chat, we get along. I didn't feel like there was any depth to them because I, I didn't have time. And so everything in my life felt incomplete and inaccessible. Like I had the things, I had the building blocks at this point, but it didn't feel like they were coming together in the right way. And it, I kept getting this weird feeling. I don't know if this will make any sense to anyone. But it was like, what I felt like is, I knew I made an account for having a good life, but I couldn't remember the password. Like it's right there. I know it's there, I know it's available to me, but I'm locked out. That is the feeling that I was living with just every day of, of this period of time. And so, this is kind of embarrassing, but whatever, um, I started to do some research on burnout. I know you might think, well, wouldn't a psychologist already know about burnout? Like I did, but I knew that I was heading towards a burnout and I didn't know what to do about it. So I started doing some research and every single thing that I read about burnout proposed one of two solutions, or sometimes both. Either you need to decrease your stress, or you need to add in, like, recovery uh, tools. You know, you need to do things to recover from the things you're doing. Add in relaxation techniques, add in hobbies, like, extra stuff, right? And the more I read this stuff, like, honestly, the more upset I was getting, because neither of those solutions applied to my situation. The thing I was most stressed about was feeling like I didn't have enough to give to all these wonderful, important things in my life. And so the decreasing stress, there, there was no mechanism to decrease stress. Because everything I was reading about decreased stress was like, don't work as much, don't, don't work as hard, work on your work-life balance. Like the balance wasn't the problem because I also felt like I wasn't doing enough at work. I felt like I wasn't doing enough anywhere, like I said before. There's no way to reduce stress if that's how you feel. What, what is the action step that creates the reduction in stress? There isn't one. Work-life balance, I felt like I wasn't giving enough to either one. The ratio, shifting that ratio, adjusting it by an hour or two a week or even like five hours a week in either direction wasn't gonna do anything. It wasn't gonna change how I felt. And adding in new things would take the place of the things I was already doing. I was like more sun up to sundown, moment I got up to the moment I went to bed, I was doing stuff. I was doing stuff that felt important and I still felt like it wasn't enough. So if I'm gonna add something to my life, I'm gonna add like, I know it's cliche, but like add a weekly spa day or a massage or something. Well, instead of what? Instead of doing something that's important to me that I already feel like I'm not doing enough of, that I feel like my life would be better if I could do more of this thing, neither of those solutions made sense. I knew what I actually needed, but I didn't know how to get it. What I actually needed was more resources. If I had more time, more energy, and more attention, it would have solved every problem. But no one appeared to know how to do that. So I started a little personal endeavor to try to see if I could solve that problem. Um, and I did because as I sit here in front of you today, 2023, I am probably three times as busy, no joke, as I was in 2015. Um, 
I've started, I've founded multiple intensive outpatient programs since that time. Like I said, I've had a second kid. Um, my house takes a lot more work. I'm, I'm back in the gym and taking care of my fitness. I am, I'm the most involved dad that I know. Like my family is, is a one top priority to me. Um, I wrote a book, I'm writing a second book. I have a YouTube channel. I have a podcast. I, I I'm, I'm 300% busier than 2015. And yet I am less stressed. I have more time, I have more energy, I have more attention, I feel better, I am excited about my day. I used to just wake up, my goal in 2015, I'd wake up and my goal was survive. Get from this moment when your eyes open to the moment when you get to like lay down in bed and relax and close your eyes. That was, that was my end game. Finish the day and like don't lose your mind. I don't feel that way anymore. I'm happy like with my life. I, I am excited to do almost, there's a couple parts of my day that I like, I'm never gonna love writing reports. It's just not that great, but I enjoy most of my day. I'm excited about my day. I, I like every phase of my day and I'm not just waiting for the end of the day. I'm actually living my life now. And, and I'm 39 years old and I've probably only felt that way for like two or three years. So what I did, there's not one exact answer, but there is one core thing that I did, which is I looked at my allocation of resources, time, energy, and attention, and I focused as much of them as possible into doing things, into spending them, right, on activities that increased the availability of time, energy, and attention. In other words, think of a, a two-part bar graph, okay? Your day, your responsibilities, whatever, whatever you have to do every day, probably takes up the majority of your resources, right? Some days it may even take all of them, and that's okay. That is just the reality that some of us find ourselves in right now. But on a lot of days, there's probably at least just a little bit, it may be a very, very small amount, but there's a little bit left over. Not every second of your day is spoken for, right? You still have at least some brain power left once you've done all the things you need to do, hopefully. Usually, when we're feeling very close to burnout, when we're feeling exhausted and, and wiped out, we use that little bit of leftover on things that help us distract and disconnect because we consider that to be recovery from this depleted state that we're in. But distracting and disconnecting are not recovery. Recovery would be using that little bit of leftover you have to grow your margin, to grow those resources so that you can get out of this cycle of emotional poverty. So that you can get out of this pattern of like, just trying to get to that moment. Just trying to get all these things done so I can just get to the moment where I don't have to do things anymore. If that's how you're living, how long are you gonna be able to do that for? Like just be real with yourself for a minute. Are you gonna be able to do that for the rest of your life? Whatever that is, 20, 30, 40, 50 more years, every day is a battle of attrition. Every day, I just hope I make it to the end. Every day I'm just looking forward to these few little moments where I don't have to do anything. How long is that gonna work for you? I knew in 2015, I can't live like this forever. I knew it wasn't gonna work. I knew I had to do something different. And if you're still watching by this point, I suspect you probably feel the same. So let's talk about doing something different. What I want you to think about doing is take that, that most precious, that most sacred part of your day, take the thing that you're looking forward to every day and change what you're doing with it. Put it into something that's gonna give you more. And, and there's a lot of things that that could be, right? Broadly speaking, these are gonna be self-care type activities. That could be going to bed earlier because a lot of us are not getting enough sleep. That could be getting better at like preparing meals because a lot of us don't eat in a way that supports our physical and mental health. That could be being physically active. I'll give you an example, okay? Let's say it's going for a walk. Let's say that you have 20 to 30 minutes a day that you use to like play a game or browse social media or, or have a drink or whatever it is that you do. Okay? Whatever you do to recover from the stressors of your day. You take that same amount of resources that you're putting into that recovery activity and instead you go for a walk. 
Now you do that one day, okay? What happens? Nothing, absolutely nothing. It, it, you get a little boost, you feel a little bit better. You, you might actually feel worse that day net though, like compared to what you'd normally do. Because going for a walk probably is not as distracting, it does not help you detach from your life or your feelings as much as browsing social media or whatever, or scrolling, right? It, it, it's not a very distracting activity. And so from a standpoint of how do I feel about the inescapable reality of this mismatch of resources and, and like what I have and what I need, not great. But what if you took a walk every day for like three months? I, I know that sounds like a very long time, but just picture those resources again, right? Picture a graph. Flatline is what's happening if you're not doing this. If, if every day is the same, you're not doing anything to increase your resources. And that's probably actually feeling like it's a downward spiral. <coughs> Excuse me. Because for most of us, our lives get bigger and busier and harder the older we get. We tend to accumulate more and more responsibilities at home, at work, socially. Uh, we don't usually move in the opposite direction. So if you are not growing those resources, their availability in your life is probably shrinking. It probably feels like there's like a guillotine over your neck because it feels close to that breaking point, close to that burnout point. If you spend 20 to 30 minutes a day on something that you know, if you can make it a habit, if you can make it consistent, is gonna give you more time, more energy, and more attention, eventually that will pay off. And what will happen is, for, for two reasons. One is, your brain works better, right? All of the things I mentioned, all those self-care activities, they actually make your brain work better and quicker. So I know you might be thinking like, how do I get more time by doing, like going for a walk does not give me more time. It does not physically, like logistically give you more time, obviously, like a day is 24 hours, there's no getting around that. How it gives you more time is it increases your cognitive efficiency. So how well your brain functions in a day is not a, is not a static parameter, it's a dynamic parameter. It, it's a variable and it fluctuates based on what you're doing. Regular physical activity increases blood flow to the brain, to the brain which improves memory, it improves focus, it improves concentration, and improves our ability to tune out distractions. People lose like hours, one to two hours a day, I think is the average statistic, to forgetfulness, distractions, procrastination. If you could get your brain to function in a way that you are not prone to those problems, to those issues, then you functionally gain more time in your day. You do. Energy, attention, being physically active increases these things. So does a lot of the other examples that I talked about earlier. So if you can make this a consistent habit, if you can make this something you do every day, again, go back to that first graph, right? My day takes this much, I've got a little bit left over. What happens is that leftover grows a little bit because you now have more resources. Not only that, but after some period of time, the amount of resources it takes to go for that walk will actually shrink because it's become just a regular ingrained part of your day. Think about it like driving to work. When you drive to work at, at a new job for the first time, it takes a lot of attention to make sure you get there, right? Because you, you're not familiar with the route yet. You don't know what you're doing. And you have to really focus on like directions and landmarks and stuff. I mean, I know we all use GPS now, but you still gotta pay attention, right? When you've been at the same job for, you know, a year, how much attention do you have to spend on driving to work? Basically none. It completely frees up your brain during that part of your day to do other things. You've automated this core task that you need to do regularly. And if you stick with these behavioral changes long enough to get to that automated phase, it still takes time, but it takes almost no energy or attention. I mean, the energy it takes to go for a walk will go down if you make it consistent too, because you increase your physical fitness, you increase your cardiovascular health. So it gives you more resources and takes less the longer you do it. Most people dramatically underestimate the length of time it takes for a behavior change to really stick. Because there's a lot of like seemingly really optimistic uh, research and like statements out there of, you know, it only takes 10 days or two weeks or something like that to make a habit. But I'm not talking about making a habit just to the point where you like do it. I'm talking about m mastering it. Not literally like I am the master of walking, but 
getting to the point where it's really just second nature to you. That depends on the behavior because it's, we're not talking about habits, we're talking about skills. We're talking about building up a skill in your life. It takes more than two weeks. It takes a while. It can take months. If it's a really complicated activity, it could take years. But that's still faster than not doing it because if you don't do it, you're moving in the wrong direction. So back to our graphs. You now have a little bit more extra in your day because you've increased your availability of resources by creating this new routine that gives you more every day. What I want you to do with that increased surplus that you've now found, you now just have like, like you don't feel quite as close to your limit every day. Is you take that and you reinvest in another activity that you know is gonna increase time, energy, and attention. Maybe you focus on sleep hygiene. Maybe you focus on nutrition. You, you, you pick something else that you know is gonna help with that. And you go all in on that thing. You take this extra, again, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, building in this new task, this new habit. And not only does that create all the changes we've talked about already, there's a whole other level to this that we have not even touched yet. It starts to change your identity. And so we make hundreds of thousands of decisions every day. I know it doesn't feel like you do. I know you probably think you make like a few hundred, maybe. It's hundreds of thousands. The reason it doesn't feel that way is most of your decisions are what are called micro decisions or subconscious decisions. Meaning they, they are so like minuscule or at least your brain appraises them as so minuscule, they do not even reach your level of conscious thinking. You literally don't think about making the decision, but you make the decision nonetheless. Your subconscious mind, like your midbrain, makes that decision and it makes those decisions based on who you think you are. It makes the decisions based on your sense of identity. It basically says like, well, I'm this type of person. What would this type of person do in this situation? Okay, that, okay, I'll do that. So when you take actions that change your identity, you're not just, you're not just going for a walk. You're creating subconscious changes in your brain. You are changing how you see yourself. And what that does is it changes this entire ecosystem of decision-making. So let's say we're talking about health, right? You're trying to become a healthier person. You start going for a walk regularly. Your brain, after some period of time, stops saying, I'm an unhealthy person who goes for walks to try to not be, health, not be unhealthy. And it starts to say, I am a healthy person because I've been doing this thing for a while. So this is no longer a thing I'm playing at. This is now me. This is now a part of my identity. And because it incorporates that into your identity, all these other things that you're gonna to wanna to do, again, you know, sleeping, nutrition, things like that, they all start to change too, even before you actually start to work on them. Because you are viewing yourself now as the type of person who does those things. So there will be less friction, there will be less resistance to making each additional change in this domain of your life once you make the first one. Because it feels less like a new identity, it feels less fake. Like basically we're talking about imposter syndrome here. And it feels more like, oh, that, you know, I am the kind of person who would do that. In fact, it's kind of weird that I'm not already doing that. I think I'm gonna start doing that now. There's a, still a whole nother level to this. I don't believe, I'm pretty sure this is legit. It's technically just my opinion. I don't believe that actions have inherent value. I believe that the value of an action depends entirely on our personal values. So let me give you an example. Working in a soup kitchen, if you are someone who's passionate about helping the needy or helping the homeless or helping the less fortunate, working in a soup kitchen is probably a very rewarding thing to do, right? Because you're taking an action that aligns with the core value that you have. You're doing something that you're really passionate about and that you believe is really important. So it's gonna feel really good to do that thing. It, it, it matters to you. If you're, I think I know this sounds terrible, but if you're like not terribly passionate about helping the homeless, I would have to think that working in a soup kitchen would probably be kind of a terrible job. I mean, it, you know, it seems like it would be like pretty repetitive and, and not all that psychologically stimulating. I, I've never done this, so this is, you know, I'm, this is purely a metaphor right now. But that's something that can have a huge range of value depending on who you are and what you value, right? The same is true 
of taking care of yourself. So I've, I've uh, conceptualized four levels of self-care. Level zero is when you don't believe you matter to anybody. And if you don't believe you matter to anybody, nothing you do is gonna make a difference. It, it just feels like screaming into a void, right? It just feels like you're, you're throwing your time and energy away on taking care of yourself because nobody, including you, cares about you. That was me ages 13 and 20. Like, I wasn't taking care of myself. I don't think it would have mattered tremendously if I did though, because I, I didn't believe I was important to, to anybody. Um, that being said, I want you to know, if that sounds like you, if you feel like, oh, I'm at level zero, like what he just said is how I feel, it's a lie. Like that feeling of I, I am not important to anyone in this entire universe is a lie. I would even say it's like a delusion. It's not real. <coughs> Excuse me. And <coughs> like to prove that, I care about you. I know, okay, that might sound stupid. Like this is pre-recorded. I, <coughs> sorry. I don't even know who you are, right? Probably. I mean, depending on who you are, I might know who you are, but it doesn't matter because I know what that feeling is like. I know how isolating it is. I know how miserable it is and how surreal it is. And I care about anybody who's feeling that way because I've been there. I have empathy for your situation if that's you. I, I, I know it probably doesn't seem like I don't probably look or sound like the kind of person who would understand those feelings, but I do. I really, really do. So if you're there right now, I do care about you and I want things to be better for you. So you're not at level zero, even if you think you are. And I pretty much guarantee I'm not the only person who cares about you either. I just can only speak for myself. So basically the level is the base multiplier of your values, right? So if you're at level zero, whatever value an action would have, walking, sleep hygiene, nutrition, etc., gets multiplied by zero, which means it is worthless because it feels like it's not important. Level one of your self-care journey is believing that other people care about you. So when you're here, you're taking care of yourself mostly for the benefit of others. You don't necessarily care about you, but you do understand and acknowledge and believe that other people do care about you and that other people would, you know, have feelings if something happened to you or do have feelings about the fact that like your life is not going the way you want it to. And so you, you care for yourself as a proxy for caring for them, if that makes sense, which is better than nothing. It means every action basically is at face value. It has whatever value it has to other people. It also tends to mean that you're only going to do the actions that help you take care of yourself when there is an obvious connection to someone else. Like when you're with people, when people can see you, or if you know that an action you could take uh, would affect someone else, you'll think about them. But there's going to be a lot of things that are just for you, right? Like brushing your teeth at night, for example. Is anyone going to know if you did that or not? It depends on your lifestyle, I guess, but a decent chance that they wouldn't, right? And so when you're at level one, when it's just about you, when the only accountability is to yourself and the only benefit that you can see is for yourself, you're still often not going to do those things. Not because you're, you're being showy, you're trying to get validation, but because if it's only for you, it still feels like it doesn't matter. It feels like it only matters if it's for somebody else. That's level one. Level two self-care is when you start to do things for you. When you start to matter to yourself. And this makes everything you do more valuable. So the, the base multiplier is now two, right? Going for a walk is not something I do just for other people so that they don't worry about my health. It's something I do for me to benefit myself because I am starting to care about myself. And if you're wondering like, well, how does a person progress? How does a person move through these levels? Mainly by doing them. The act of caring for something makes you care about something. And what gets measured gets improved. We know this in healthcare. If you're trying to pay attention to something, if you conceptualize these four levels, and we haven't talked about level three yet, but we will, and you conceptualize this as something I'm trying to move through, and you think about that during the day, and you connect those levels to your actions, you'll move. You'll grow, you'll improve. It's doing it and then being aware that you're doing it. Like, I know that sounds so incredibly simple and stupid that it might make you want to punch me in the face, but I promise you it's real. So level two, everything is more valuable now because it's something you're doing for you. Level three 
is when this whole thing starts to skyrocket. And I, I feel like I kind of went too quick over the, like what is getting multiplied is that benefit that you get from doing these things, that buffer, going back to the very first graph, right? When I actually do this presentation, I'll have like actual slides, so you know, bear with me here. But it increases the value you get from it because it feels more important to you. It feels more worth it. Level three self-care is taking care of yourself being there for you, doing right by you, doing things that help you, is mission aligned for you. It feels like a core value. It feels like one of the most important things that you can possibly do in the world. And I know that seems lofty, probably. We're gonna talk about that in a second. This exists because I'm there. I'm at level three. And I was at level zero. So I've, I've been all of these things. That's, this is where my whole model comes from. I didn't read this in textbook. No one taught this to me. I learned this by living my life and going from like one of the most miserable people in the world to someone who is extremely, extremely content with his life. This was my path and this was my progression. And once I started to conceptualize it in this way, I started to see it over and over and over again with other people I worked with too. I absolutely believe, I know in my heart that this is real because I've lived it. And I know that if someone told me this when I was 17, I wouldn't believe it. So if you're feeling skeptical of what I'm saying right now, that really all I have to do is like, pick one thing, do that one thing consistently, and care about that one thing, and my life will change dramatically. I know that that probably sounds so oversimplified that it borders on offensive. It's real. It, it's not a, com it, it's hard to do, but it's not a complicated thing. It really isn't. And that's why it breaks my heart that so many people are not able to get past this point. But level three, caring for me, is part of my mission in life. It's one of the most important things I'll ever do. It's one of the most valuable things I'll ever do. If that feels hard to believe, let me explain a, a metaphor to you. So I spent a lot of my childhood in a town called Marcel. Marcel's in northern Minnesota. Very, very small town. Like, three, four hundred people, maybe. Um, there's not a lot in Marcel. There's like, there's a bait shop slash gas station slash grocery store. Um, so you can get food and basic necessities, but like there's no uh, medical care in Marcel. There's no school in Marcel. So a lot of the things that you need to live, you have to leave Marcel to get them, right? There's only one road that goes to the two neighboring towns. So the, the, there's a town north of Marcel called Big Fork. It's like 1,500 people, I think, about 10 miles north. And then about 25 miles south is Grand Rapids, which is more of a city. Uh, it's not Grand Rapids, Michigan, but there's, there's, more, there's more than one Grand Rapids. And that's like 15,000 people, I think. So it's a decent sized city. There's one road that runs from Big Fork to Grand Rapids. And therefore that road, if you live in Marcel, is the only road that takes you to these places. It's called Highway 38. It's a beautiful road. It's probably not a very important road to most people though. Like it's not, it's only about 40 miles. It's not a major, I don't think there's a lot of like <laughs> commerce that happens on that road, you know? Um, it's not a very busy road, not that many people are on it. So Highway 38 is not objectively the most important road in the world, right? It's objectively not that important at all. So subjectively, objectively means factually, like this is true for all people. Subjectively means this is true for me or this is true for like a, a handful of people, but it's not necessarily true for everybody. Objectively, Highway 38 is not that important. Subjectively, if you live in Marcel, Highway 38 is the most important road in the world. Because if it is blocked by snow or an accident or something like that, you're trapped. And you can't access the things you need to access to live your life. Highway 38 is you, right? Uh, going back to work-life balance, it's, it, it's not the answer. It, it's not the problem. Because you spend 100% of your time, whether you're at work, whether you're at home, or whether you're anyone, anywhere else, you spend 100% of your time inside of yourself. That's your most important environment. And if being you and being in that environment is generally a pleasant experience, 
you'll probably be reasonably happy at home and at work, as long as neither of them are objectively terrible, right? If being you is inherently an unpleasant experience, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how much time you spend in the various environments that you go to throughout your week. That ratio is a trap. That ratio is not even that important because it's all going to feel terrible because being you feels terrible. Because the only way in and out, your only access point to your life is you, right? That's that trapped feeling I had before. That, that thing I mentioned about like, I know I made this account, but I, I can't remember my password. I had the things that a person would need to have to have a good life and be happy, but I couldn't access them because I was trapped inside of myself and I did not enjoy being myself. And until I learned how to take better care of myself, that did not change. So your ability to care for yourself is Highway 38. It's the only way in and out. It's, it's ultimately the biggest determinant of your subjective quality of life. You are not objectively the most important person in the world. I'm not trying to convince you you are. That would be narcissism. That's not helpful. Subjectively, you would better be the most important person in the world to you because you're not to anyone else probably. Which means that if you aren't taking care of yourself the way you need to be cared for, no one else is going to do it. So it's just not going to get done. And, and your life is going to suck. And, and again, I know this might sound like tremendously oversimplified, but humor me. What do you got to lose? One other thing I want to talk about. And because I know that all of this, like the idea of giving up these, these distractions and these disconnections, it might sound really extreme, so I, I do want to just briefly go back to that before I wrap up for today. Another Highway 38 story is a very influential location in my life. There were, there were a lot of fields on Highway 38, and, and most of them were just like grass, right? There was this one spot I remember that had these beautiful pinkish-purple flowers, and, and they were really um, noticeable. There was the only spot on this entire like 20 mile stretch of road that had them. And I remember, <coughs> I don't remember if it was my mom or my dad, but <coughs> sorry. I remember asking one of my parents, like, what are those? Those are so cool. They, they really catch my eye. What are those beautiful flowers? And I think it was my dad. This sounds like something he would have said. He's like, he, he told me what they are. And then he's like, but they're an invasive species. They don't actually belong. You know, they're not supposed to be there. They're like from England or something like that. They're not... They're not meant to be in, in Minnesota. So actually, like, they're bad. And I, I didn't understand. I was like, I, they're beautiful, though. Like, I love those flowers. I loved it. They're like a highlight of my day when I see them. How can they be bad? Are they, are they like, poisonous or something? He's like, no, they're not, they're not poisonous. They don't, they don't directly harm anything. You know, they, just by sitting there and being flowers, they're not doing any damage whatsoever. In fact, yeah, maybe they're, they're nice to look at, okay? The damage they're doing is that they compete for resources with native species, like native prairie grasses and things like that. So under the soil, there's water, right? And these flowers that aren't supposed to be there suck up water, which means that some of the other plants around it that are supposed to be there, they don't have enough water and they die. And so going back to resources, right? Your, I mean, water is an important resource for humans, but I don't think that's what we're worried about today, right? Your resources are time, energy, and attention. What tends to happen in life is we find these distractions, right, that are often really rewarding, really stimulating, and they function as an invasive species in our lives. They end up being something that soaks up all the resources. Like mine, okay, I'm gonna tell you a little personal tale here. My biggest like addiction, let's say in my entire life, has been video games because there's something about video games in my brain that is just like simultaneously amazing and terrible. They are so, they, they stimulate my brain in a way that nothing else, nothing else does, which is embarrassing to say because I don't even think video games are important, but they're incredibly stimulating to my brain and I completely just lose myself in them. And so picture, picture a 10 point scale, okay? I know I'm all about the, imagine this graph. It'll be better when I have real graphs, but imagine a 10 point scale. And this scale is measuring how rewarding various activities are to you, okay? 
an anchor point on a subjective scale is whatever the best thing for you is personally. So like, you know, the pain scale at the hospital, when they say like, you know, what is a 10 for your physical pain? Your benchmark for a 10 is the most physical pain you've ever experienced, right? Because that's, your understanding ends with the worst thing or the best thing that's ever happened to you. And you, you, you might logically know there's stuff beyond that, but since you haven't experienced it, you can't really make it part of your scale. That's an anchor point. So imagine a 10 point scale of reward. Whatever you do on a regular basis that is the most rewarding thing to your brain, that doesn't mean it even mean it's the most pleasurable or that you regard it as the most important. It means it's the most rewarding. It means it's the thing that you tend to come back to over and over and over again when you have downtime. That's what it means. If that's a 10, what you need to be mindful of is what is the gap between the most rewarding things you do in your life and the things that you have to do? Because when video games were a part of my life, all the essentials were like threes and fours. Like it's really sad to say that, but it's true. That's how my brain works. Work, school, going to the gym, relationships, taking care of my home. These things were all like threes on this 10 point scale with gaming being a 10 because gaming is so much more stimulating to my brain than anything else. What that means is I didn't ever, I didn't want to do anything else. Even if I knew I had, to, like I, I did, I would do the bare minimum, I'd do what I had to do. And the whole time I would be doing anything else, I'd be thinking about gaming. So I avoided doing other things. When I did them, it was very like begrudging and I was constantly daydreaming about the next time I was gonna do the thing I really wanted to do. It made everything else in my life feel like a distraction or feel like a detriment to the thing my brain really wanted me to do. And I consider that analogous to these flowers. It's an invasive species in my life because it's not causing direct harm. You know, I wasn't like getting fired from work or going broke or, or in like debilitatingly bad physical health because I was playing video games. They were just taking the place of more important things in my life, things that were meant to be there things that were essential to my ecosystem. Those things were getting choked out. Like they were, the, their resources were getting limited because I was pouring so much into this other thing. Here's where it gets really crazy though. So if you think of that 10 point scale again, and then think about your actual day and your allocation of time. If the thing that is a 10 for you, if that's, if that's that thing that you use that little bit of leftover you have every day for, you're probably doing that thing, what, one or two hours a day tops, right? So for one or two hours a day, you're, you're doing the thing that's a 10 out of 10. For the remaining 14 or so waking hours you have, assuming you have good sleep hygiene, if you don't, it's more than that probably, you're doing things that are like subpar to your brain, the to things that your brain is less interested in. So your mean, your average stimulation level throughout the day then is very low because you're spending most of your day doing things that rank very low on your stimulation scale because they're always compared on some level to this high stimulation thing. So this thing that you like, you love, right? You really look forward to every day. If you were, don't hate me, just, just visualize, okay? If you were to take that thing and just yank it out of your life and say, I'm done, this is gone. Your scale would reset. Not instantly, it takes some time. But that 10 point scale, those anchor points, after a, after a period of time when you're not doing the 10, something else still has to be a 10. But remember, all this other stuff, all the things you had to do were, were kind of clustered in a very similar level, right? Mostly threes and fours. Whatever your favorite remaining thing is, that thing becomes your new 10 after some period of time. And probably the lowest anything else is then is like an eight. That's the difference. That's the biggest difference between me now and me in 2015. Because what I actually do in a day, my lifestyle is not that different. It isn't. But I enjoy everything I do so much more because A, I have enough resources to do it. I don't feel like it's draining the life out of me because I'm doing the things I need to do to replenish and increase the availability of those resources. And B, I'm not on some level, even subconsciously, comparing everything I do in my day 
to this incredibly high value thing that makes everything else in my life feel unrewarding. And so I probably don't do anything in my day that's less than an eight now because I, I don't play video games anymore other than I play a little bit with my son as a, like a social bonding thing. That's it. I completely removed them from my life. And my life has never been better, which is the most bizarre. I, I would have told you that that's something I could never do. That I, like literally, I probably would have said I couldn't live without them. Not like physically, I'm gonna die, but like my life wouldn't be good without them because they were so much more stimulating and rewarding to me than everything else. That was the problem though. The thing that you love most might be ruining your life. It was for me. Well, that's my first attempt at the presentation. Hopefully I didn't screw it up too bad. Um, hope you got some value out of this and sorry for all the coughing. I don't really know what that was about. I'm not even sick, but thanks for listening. I know this was a long one. I hope you liked it. Take care.